At the start of the 1950s, supersonic flight and jet aircraft were the way of the future. Problem was, very little was actually known about flight beyond Mark II. To try and fill this gap in knowledge, American manufacturer Douglas produced the X-3, a research plane designed to gather data at speeds of up to 2,000 miles per hour. Well, that was the theory at least. But of course, even the best planned theory doesn't always work out in the real world. Throughout history, some machines are regarded as great. Their pioneering innovation, groundbreaking performance, market-leading success or battlefield glory have made them legends, and they have gone on to be enshrined in the history books. This is not their story. These, instead, are the stories of the forgotten many. The failed designs, sales flops and occasional unsung heroes that have become the yardstick against which the legends are compared. Yet they deserve to be so much more than that, for in their own unique way, they are parts of history. The origins of the X-3 Stiletto lie not in the 1950s, but in January of 1945, before the sound barrier was officially broken, and in fact, before World War II had even ended. Despite the ongoing conflicts in both Europe and the Pacific, the United States was feeling confident about its eventual victory, and its scientists and engineers had their eyes on the future, and on the conquest of a new domain supersonic flight. In the 1940s, the existence of some kind of barrier at or around the speed of sound was acknowledged, and the aviation industry wondered if it could be broken. The sound barrier had already broken many pilots and many aircraft, but engineers at the Douglas Aircraft Company felt they could build a plane to even the score. By June 1945, the US Army Air Force issued Douglas a contract to develop high-speed research aircraft that could be used for supersonic testing by the Air Force and NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which would later become NASA. In the years between 1945, when Douglas took on the contract, and 1952, when the X-3 first flew, the science of high-speed flight advanced at, well, high speed. In 1947, the rocket-powered Bell X-1 became the first aircraft to officially break the sound barrier, and Douglas joined the new supersonic era with the D-5582 Skyrocket, which first broke the sound barrier in 1949. Meanwhile, Douglas's engineers were in the process of designing and constructing what would become the X-3. Unlike the earlier X-planes and the Skyrocket, it would be powered by a pair of turbojet engines, which required a larger fuselage for the necessary equipment. As it was supposed to take off and land under its own power, it would also need a wheeled undercarriage, which further enlarged the fuselage. To give the design a high fineness ratio, which is basically the length of the fuselage divided by its diameter, the X-3 had a distinctively long nose section, and an extended tail boom to maintain center of gravity. Of course, the other distinctive thing about the X-3 and part of the reason for its construction, were its unusually short and thin wings. Not only were the wings unusually short, but they also had a relatively low sweep back and razor sharp plan form, and were designed to test whether super low aspect ratio wings would produce less drag at supersonic speeds. When the X-3 first rolled out, the design certainly appeared to be just what the engineers needed to break records and study high speed flight. Its pointy nose, thin wings, and sleek conformal canopy gave the aircraft a better drag coefficient than any other X-plane. They also earned it the nickname Stiletto, and more subjectively, made it look like it was going at Mark II, even when it was sitting still on the tarmac. The X-3's first flight, on the 15th of October 1952, was actually unofficial as test pilot Bill Bridgman managed to lift the aircraft off the ground and fly for a mile during what was supposed to be a high-speed taxi test. Douglas would consider this flight as just a hop, with the X-3's first official flight happening five days later, on October 20th. Almost immediately, the engineers realised that they had a major problem. 
the X3 had an incredibly high takeoff speed, some 260 knots, about 480 kilometers per hour, or faster than the maximum airspeed of a DC-3 for some perspective. But that was about the only speed record it was actually able to challenge, because it turned out to be disappointingly, frustratingly slow and underpowered. In level flight, where it was supposed to blast through the sky at over Mach 2, it could only achieve about 0.98 Mach, just under the speed of sound. Although it did eventually scrape past Mach 1.2 in a 30 degree dive in July 1953. The reason behind this slowness was soon determined to be the X-3's engines. Originally, the aircraft was supposed to use two Westinghouse J-46 turbines, which were still on the drawing board during the Stiletto's design process. However, the J-46 engine soon ran into development problems. It was intended to be a successor to the J-34, a proven though largely obsolete design that had been in production since the late 1940s. Westinghouse also hoped that the J-46 would improve their reputation after the J-40, another attempt to follow up on the J-34, which was eventually cancelled after engineers failed to make a sufficiently powerful or reliable engine. Unfortunately, history was repeating itself for Westinghouse. The J-46 was 14 months behind schedule by 1952, and the version intended for the X-3, the J-46WE-2, was consistently failing to produce the required thrust. To avoid delaying the X-3 program even more, Douglas decided to use the older J-34s as interim engines while Westinghouse worked the kinks out of the J-46. However, another problem soon appeared. Not only was the new J-46 still underpowered when the X-3 first flew, but the engine had now grown so large that engineers could no longer fit two of them in the stiletto's narrow fuselage. Douglas and the US Air Force considered rebuilding the X-3 with rocket engines, but the added expense, reduced fuel tank space, and lack of a carrier plane large enough to lift the X-3 ruled it out. This meant that the X-3 was stuck with the Westinghouse J-34s, which did at least fit in the aircraft, but developed only 22 kilonewtons of thrust, as opposed to the 31 kilonewtons per engine that Douglas had planned for the J-46 to provide. As a result, the X-3 only had about 70% of the thrust it needed, which wasn't enough to get it to Mark II, and worse yet, the slim fuselage couldn't easily be modified to fit more powerful engines. The underpowered engines and resulting low speed had drastic consequences for the X-3 program. The order for the second aircraft was cancelled by the US Air Force, with the half-finished airframe being used for spare parts. The stiletto's reluctance to break the sound barrier also meant that the Air Force had to reconsider the test program. Since the aircraft wasn't capable of reaching its Mark II goal, the Air Force participated in testing for only six flights, before handing the jet over to the NACA on July 29, 1954, presumably in the hope that the Aerospace Agency could find something to do with it. The US Air Force even wrote themselves out of the flight tests, with the flights being written up as NACA Flights 1-6, to despite being performed by Air Force pilots Pete Everest and Chuck Yeager. In the hands of NACA pilot Joe Walker, who was appointed Chief Test Pilot of the X-3 program, the stiletto mostly kept on flying. Walker made three flights in September to get used to the X-3's handling, and another flight that had to be cut short due to a malfunction in the stiletto's afterburner system. On October 27, 1954 though, the X-3 finally found its niche during test flight 10. Before we get into that though, let's leave the skies over Edwards Air Force Base and go back to June 1948. In that year, a technical paper by NACA scientist William H. Phillips was published, which described, in typically scientific prose, an issue Phillips had observed with high-speed aircraft designs. As Phillips put it, the rolling motion introduces coupling between the longitudinal and lateral motions of the aircraft. An exact solution of this problem is very complicated because of the high number of degrees of freedom involved. Design trends of very high-speed aircraft, however, which include short wingspans, fuselages of high density, and flight at high altitude, 
all tend to increase the inertial forces due to rolling in comparison with the aerodynamic restoring forces provided by the longitudinal and directional stabilities. Translated out of engineering speak, what Phillips was observing was that making large control inputs in an aircraft with a relatively small wingspan compared to its fuselage length could cause it to snap out of control in all three dimensions, resulting in the plane pitching up and down, swinging left and right, or rolling out of control. Worse still, because of the narrow wingspan and heavy fuselage, a pilot might not have enough leverage to balance the aircraft and regain control, causing the forces to build in intensity until the airframe either broke up or the plane fell out of the sky. Phillips termed this phenomenon inertial coupling, and soon his research became crucially important to the pilots and engineers pushing the boundaries of high-speed flight. In 1953, Chuck Yeager had nearly crashed an X-1A when it began tumbling out of control, saying later that if he had had an ejection seat, he probably would have used it on that flight. The YF-102 Delta Dagger prototype fighter was also suffering from inertial coupling, among other issues, but the most compelling case for solving the inertial coupling crisis was the F-100 Super Saber, which had a nasty tendency to snap into violent yaws and rolls so quickly that no pilot could regain control. This, unfortunately, cost the life of North American's test pilot George Welch, who was killed when his F-100A lost control on October 12, 1954. As it happened, NACA had just received the perfect aircraft to investigate the problem, the X-3 Stiletto. With its long, thin fuselage and stubby wings, it seemed like it had been designed with inertial coupling in mind. And because its top speed in level flight was right in the transonic zone, where inertial coupling was most prevalent, it provided an ideal testbed for gathering data on the killer phenomenon. However, test pilot Joe Walker didn't have any plans to do that on October the 27th, 1954. Flight 10 was supposed to be just another envelope pushing exercise, as routine as anything could possibly be in the world of 1950s test flying. That all changed when, at 30,000 feet and 0.92 mark, Joe Walker rolled left. Suddenly, the stiletto pitched up and its nose swung hard over to the left, putting the plane into a 16 degree side slip despite Walker's control inputs in the opposite direction. Fortunately, Walker was able to pull the aircraft back to level within 5 seconds of the upset, and the forces rapidly subsided. At this point, lesser mortals might have found the nearest runway, landed the X-3 and never flown it again, but Walker was a test pilot, and he had a mission to learn the X-3's limits, and gather data that could be used to make flying safer for his fellow pilots. Either that, or he was just plain crazy. He sped up to Mach 1.05 and made another sharp left roll. This time, the results were even more dramatic than his last bout with inertial coupling. The nose swung around laterally to a maximum of 21 degrees, and the plane pitched down so severely that it hit minus 6.7 G. Walker pulled up to counteract this, and the nose shot back up with a force of 7 G, pitching up so far that the stiletto's wings almost stalled. It's worth pointing out, by the way, that all this took place within seconds of Walker making the turn. Remarkably though, Walker managed to tame the X-3 once again, and brought the aircraft back to base with no further incident. A review of the data from Flight 10 showed just how close Walker had come to not just losing control, but losing the aircraft and probably also his life. The maximum loading measured on the X-3's fuselage and tail section peaked at 63,000 pounds, almost 29 metric tons, which was right on the aircraft's design limits. The only thing stopping the wings from being overloaded, scientists determined, was the fact that there was so little air flowing over them that they barely generated any lift. Otherwise, if they had been subjected to seven times the force of gravity along with the rest of the airframe, they might have snapped right off. And given that the stiletto's ejector seat fired downwards through the cockpit floor, escaping the violently gyrating aircraft would have been difficult, to say the least. After this ordeal, the scientists continued to pore over the numbers, but the stresses experienced by the X-3 meant that it was grounded for the next 11 months undergoing a careful structural inspection. Walker flew the aircraft 10 more times, though it didn't carry out any further research into inertial coupling. 
There were, however, other incidents that dogged the stiletto's later career, including the braking parachute deploying in flight on October 12, 1955, an instrument probe getting sucked into an engine on December 13, and a short circuit that started a small fire in a test instrument package in April 1956. The X-3 flew for the final time on May 23, 1956, with Walker once again at the controls. After this flight, the plane was put on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force, where it remains to this day. Now, the phrase worst aircraft ever made gets thrown around a lot, but quite often the Douglas X-3 Stiletto finds itself a contender for that title. After all, it was designed to fly at Mark II, it was sleeker than almost anything in the sky, but in level flight, it was incapable of even breaking the sound barrier. Even its pilots didn't have much praise for it. Bill Bridgman, its first test pilot, said it was hard to keep his speed and altitude while flying it. Pete Everest called it one of the most difficult airplanes he had flown. And Joe Walker, who'd taken the jet right to its structural limits, considered it simply the worst aircraft he'd been involved with. However, the X-3 did have some positives in its legacy. It taught engineers a great deal about the use of titanium in aircraft construction, and undercarriage and tyre designers were able to benefit from the unintentional stress testing provided by the Stiletto's high takeoff speed. Another, albeit indirect, result of the X-3 program was the F-104 Starfighter. It had been in development as the X-3 was being tested, and at the Air Force's insistence, Douglas had shared plans and data with Lockheed. The Starfighter owed much of its design to the Stiletto, particularly the short, low aspect ratio wings. But with its more powerful J-79 engine, the F-104 was actually capable of reaching Mark II. A RAND Corporation report stated that Lockheed's success in building and flying a prototype less than a year after go-ahead would probably not have been possible without knowledge derived from the X-3 program. Of course, the Stiletto's most important and most enduring legacy was the flight data it generated. This data taught engineers a great deal about inertial coupling, and combined with some of the earliest uses of computers for analysing aircraft designs, this helped contribute to safer high-speed aircraft, and slowly began to change the shape of the fighter plane. Supersonic aircraft got bigger wings and control surfaces, and canards and stabilisers began to appear on new designs to make planes that were more agile at speed, yet more docile during slower flight. But as for the Stiletto itself, as an aircraft, it was largely a failure. It was let down by underpowered engines that left it unable to fulfil its primary directive of reaching Mark II, and its long heavy fuselage and tiny wings made it a menace to fly. However, the Stiletto's dangerous design and resolute refusal to go supersonic meant that quite accidentally, it became a valuable research tool during its short career. While other research planes were focused on going higher and faster with little regard to low speed performance or controllability, the X-3 managed to provide important data about the transonic zone and helped to curb the dangerous inertial coupling crisis that had already taken the lives of several pilots and might well have killed many more. Despite the setbacks, the Douglas X-3 Stiletto is an important part of history and a testament to the fact that sometimes, great breakthroughs appear in the unlikeliest of places. Mm -hmm.